Yep. Yes. Okay. Got it. Very good. So, uh, as Dr. Shankar outlined, this uh, presentation is centered around uh, advanced remote monitoring technologies and how they are being applied to help uh, preserve the economic competitiveness of our nation's nuclear power industry. So as a part of this presentation, I'll talk a little bit about the origins, the founding of the nuclear power industry, how it has grown since then, and the, the, the critical role that nuclear power plays uh, in, our, in our nation. I'll talk about the challenges that the industry is facing today and, and some of the underlying uh, situation uh, conditions that have resulted in the challenges that the industry is facing. We'll jump into the project scope that's being sponsored through the DOE grant initiative, uh, get into some of the background and details around that. And then we'll wrap things up by talking about the overall benefits that we uh, expect coming out of this initiative and uh, talk about uh, the future going forward for the industry. And so with that, we'll just jump into things. So um, <clears throat> If my, here we go. All right, in the beginning, I'll uh, take you back to December, 1953, where President Eisenhower was addressing the United Nations, uh, <clears throat> joint session of, of the United Nations. This was the height of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And, and shortly, you know, shortly after the conclusion of World War II, which uh, ultimately ended with uh, the nuclear bombs being dropped on the two cities in, in Japan. And so it was a very tense time for our world. And President Eisenhower promoted the concept of utilizing nuclear technologies for the benefit of all mankind. And so to take all of that technology that had been developed during war years and apply it to uh, peaceful initiatives for the benefit of, of everyone. And so since um, they, they called that speech, Adams for Peace. And since that time, We'll take a look. Nuclear power has grown uh, across the world. I'll, I'll focus today just on, on the scope and scale in the United States. Uh, the U.S. represents uh, the majority of nuclear generation on the planet. And uh, since Atoms for Peace, we began uh, commercial uh, generation in the late 1950s. And over several decades, we've grown uh, from, uh, from those days to a very impressive footprint. Currently operating today, there's 55 nuclear power plants across our nation, 93 operating reactors at those facilities across 28 states. And uh, you, you can see today, and uh, Dr. Shankar mentioned this, nuclear represents 20% of the total generation electric generation across our nation. And of that 20%, it represents more than half of the zero carbon clean generation uh, capability that's tied to the grid today. So that's larger than all other wind, solar, hydro, all combined does, does not match the generation footprint of of, this, of, of nuclear power in our, in our nation. While we have um, 55 plants today, 93 reactors, we pe actually peaked in about, you can see my arrow in the upper right here, we peaked in about 2012 with 102 operating nuclear reactors at that time. And since then, you can see that nuclear generation uh, from that peak is beginning to diminish. And we've lost over 6,000 uh, megawatts of generation in recent years. Uh, 
principally for economic reasons. So, <clears throat> so if my slide would advance, I'd continue on. There we go. So uh, what this has resulted in is nuclear power has become crucial for maintaining our, our country's national security interests. That includes energy independence and as well as, as national security uh, defense of, uh, of our nation. Grid stability, again, 20% uh, of generating capacity on the grid, and that's base load. That is base load uh, and key to maintaining stability, uh, particularly as more and more renewables are, are added to the grid and for achieving our environmental goals. Once again, uh, zero carbon emissions and uh, a challenge that we're having today. And I'm sorry, I don't know what is uh, having trouble with the animations for some reason. There we go. Economic competitiveness is diminishing now because of disruptive technologies uh, impacting the industry, increasing costs of production and lowering market prices. So uh, this is leading to uh, many of our nuclear power plants across the nation being retired long before the end of their operating license because they cannot economically compete in the regions they serve. This is literally a crisis for, for, for our nation. So what's causing this? Let's take a look at, at the external environment and what's impacting uh, the nuclear power industry. There is a revolution afoot. Uh, it's much different than, than the days of George Washington, but we are in the midst of a revolution. Klaus Schwab, uh, the, uh, the chairman of the World Economic Forum, talks about how our, as a society, we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter all aspects of our lives. Scale, scope, and complexity will be like nothing humankind has experienced before. And Klaus calls this the, the fourth industrial revolution. Huh. Wow. So what I'm sure many of you are familiar with this concept. For those that are not, just as a, a bit of background, if we are in the midst of, of, some, of the so-called fourth industrial revolution, there must have been three that preceded the one we're in. And so this is the timeline. It, it began in the 1800s as we harnessed uh, and mechanized the power of water and steam. And, and that led into uh, mass production capabilities as part of the second industrial revolution where we further improved capabilities in mass production through harnessing of electrical power and organizing labor and developing labor disciplines to focus on optimizing individual tasks to increase productivity. In the 70s, we lived through a third industrial revolution where we applied computers and technology, so electronics and, and, and automation of, uh, of, of, uh, of, these, uh, of these production operations to further improve uh, uh, production and, and the quality of productions. And so today in the fourth industrial revolution, it's unlike anything we've experienced before. It actually represents a convergence of what cyber technologies bring uh, including machine learning and artificial intelligence and a convergence of all of that with physical systems. And that's resulting in, in machines helping augment human decisions. It's resulting in autonomous vehicles, 3D printing, and, and you all are very familiar with, with the things that uh, are coming about today. Uh, 
you know, drones delivering pizzas to your doorstep and that sort of thing, just amazing capabilities. And we're just on the, the beginning of this, of this revolution. And so back to the nuclear power industry and what's going on that's, that's causing the disruption. So we are clearly having a Sputnik moment for those of you that might remember or have read about uh, the, the Sputnik satellite, the first artificial satellite in Earth's orbit that during the Cold War launched by the Soviet Union and, and uh, how that ultimately uh, that Sputnik moment ultimately led to the United States uh, developing spaceflight capabilities and landing a man on the moon by the, by the end of the decade. So, so the nuclear industry, as many other in industries have as a part of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, is in the midst of a Sputnik moment. You'll remember Kodak, totally obliterated by the transition from, from uh, you know, photographic film to digital technologies, the smartphones that we all carry in our pockets every day. If we went back to the mid 1980s and we were to go and buy all of the equipment and software that is, all, is embedded in that handheld uh, device now, you'd be spending over $900,000 to have those capabilities that we, that we all just take for granted on a, on a daily basis. And Uber and how that has completely disrupted, you know, the taxi industry, for example. And now disruptive technologies are demonetizing uh, the power industry, including, you know, coal, uh, natural gas, nuclear, it's, it's all being impacted, uh, being demonetized. And uh, the world as, the, as we know it from an energy generation and distribution perspective, it's going to be completely transformed in, in the coming years. So how do we sustain nuclear? So, Nuclear sustainability mandates that we find ways to reduce our operating expenses. We transform those core business processes. The things that we do to keep those plants operating are very expensive and based upon decades old technologies. New technology enables, offers the opportunity to us to technologically innovate and modernize these facilities to reduce the operating costs of the facilities and sustain their benefit uh, uh, for many more years to come. And so to address this challenge, uh, the Advanced Remote Monitoring and Diagnostic Services Program was born. The vision of this project was to preserve the economic competitiveness of our nation's nuclear energy supply through the transformation of those core business processes through the application of advanced technologies. So you can see this, is, this project is all in as a $14 million uh, uh, government sponsored project. The Department of Energy is, is funding up the majority of this project, and we're also in partnership with Idaho National Labs, and Lehigh University is also playing a central role as a part of the project. Uh, the Utility Service Alliance, just a little background on the USA Alliance. USA is a not-for-profit cooperative that provides engineering, technical services, to, uh, to member nuclear utilities. We have all in, we have eight member utilities across the United States that represents 14 operating nuclear reactors, over 15,000 megawatts electric. And we have four of our eight members participating in the ARM initiative. And you can see those companies at, at the bottom 
and the nuclear their nuclear facilities that are participating. And we'll jump into more details around all, all that here in a bit. So project scope is threefold for the advanced remote monitoring project. First is the establishment of a 24 seven monitoring and diagnostic service for our, for our uh, reactors that are participating in this program. Second is the creation of an intelligent technology platform that can be shared across all of the participants with the goal of reducing costs through sharing of that technology. And third, technologically transforming those legacy nuclear business processes that have become too expensive to, uh, to, to maintain. So I'll talk about each of those objectives uh, individually, get into some of the details. So objective number one is the establishment of, of a 24 seven around the clock monitoring and diagnostic services as a part of this industry demonstration project to help understand the potential value to the nuclear industry and what might be possible. So uh, Dr. Shane Carr mentioned, uh, monitoring and diagnostic services, the Luminance Power Optimization Center. And so that's, they actually are playing a role in, in this project. And so this is a shot of, of Luminance uh, Power Optimization Center, POC. And this center has been in operation for over 15 years, providing uh, generation uh, technical engineering services to uh, the, to luminance generating fleet. And I'll, I'll get more into those details in just a moment. So this center is providing monitoring of five nuclear units as part of this project. That includes our uh, luminance two reactors at Comanche Peak, uh, Susquehanna nuclear plant, Talon Energy, that's the two units there. And then up in Washington State Energy Northwest, and, um, and their uh, generating station, Columbia, up, up in Washington. And so again, the, demo, this, the point of this is to demonstrate the value of this type of service to help preserve economic competitiveness and where are the opportunities to grow this kind of capability to further sustain things. So this is a, a deeper, we're going to do a deeper dive into what the POC is all about. Uh, it, 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 it's a whole lot more than just a bunch of, of plasma screens on a wall with a bunch of computers. It's, it's a pretty nifty operation. So since the early days, the POC has grown from a generating, monitoring maybe a dozen generating units within Texas only, we now are monitoring power plants coast to coast, over 50 stations, over 100 operating units, including uh, multiple nuclear facilities. We've got 10 coal plants across the Midwest in Texas, 37 combined cycle and uh, natural gas facilities. And we're even now monitoring uh, solar generating facilities and, and the world's large, largest battery uh, storage facility out in Monterey Bay in California. And so what the POC does, it's tied into the control systems of all of these plants. We can't operate the plants, only monitor, but we bring in all of that data, streaming data real time, and we, and we perform advanced analytics to help identify reliability and performance issues as, as they are emerging and help get the plant operators in a position to avoid generation losses and catastrophic equipment failures and that sort of thing, to ultimately to, to optimize revenues and, uh, and, and maintain a, the highest possible levels of, of reliability. So all the number crunching goes on in the center with the engineers and the advanced analytics and all that information is fed back to the operating crews, the maintenance crews, and the engineering staff at all the plants that are serviced. So that's pretty neat. Here's a little more detail around the fleet level services that the POC provides to 
um, to the plants they serve. So monitoring of chemistry and plant power manipulations and problem equipment and emergent issues and expanding monitoring through advanced wireless technologies uh, represents the all-in services that are currently provided uh, to the, the plants that, that are monitored. Uh, at the plant or the POC also deploys, expands its capabilities using wireless technologies in many of the facilities that it, that it monitors and, and can expand that at times when problems emerge, when uh, a deeper insight uh, is, is required to help us sustain uh, continuity of operation. And so some of the success stories, this center has been operating for 15 years and uh, part of the purpose of today's presentation was to talk about what do these monitoring centers, they're popping up all over the world now, what are they doing uh, and, and what kind of value are, are, are the utilities seeing out of this? And so I'll share three examples of contributions, of hundreds of contributions over the years. This uh, was at a coal plant uh, back in 2005. This was actually the very first day of operation and the very first find that the center had. They were monitoring this coal plant out in Far East Texas. And we turned on the center for the first time that day and thousands and thousands and thousands of alarms were coming in. False alarm, false alarm, modeling problems. and wading through all that disaster, <laughs> we found one that looked real. And so the operators on duty were taught and the engineers like, this looks real, what should we do? Well, let's call the plant. So they called the control room of a plant hundreds of miles away. And the operators in the control room had no idea who these people were in Dallas that were called some kind of problem they were having on one of their big fans. And so uh, after, after explaining this new service that, that, that they were now the beneficiaries of, the operators said, okay, I understand, we'll talk to you. And so explain that we've got a small problem with one of your fans that seems to be vibrating unusually. And so they went out and took a look at the fan and found an internal oil leak then the oil, the draft of the fan was drawing the oil onto the fan blades, coal dust was settling on the blades and it was starting to vibrate. That bearing housing was running, was completely out of oil and would have catastrophically uh, destroyed itself within a handful of days. The operators were able to nurse that machine along, get into an outage a day later and make the repairs before catastrophic failure because of the phone call from Dallas. Here's a similar situation at a natural gas fired plant. The green looking device on the left is the main power transformer at this plant. Every watt of electricity generated goes through that transformer onto the grid. That's where the magic happens. And you can see those round looking devices on the side. Those are the fans that keep these transformers cool as hundreds and hundreds of millions of watts flow through them. And so one day in the monitoring center in the POC, we received alarms. Tem oil temperatures inside this transformer were screaming up. So the plant was called. They thought the center, there was something wrong with the center's systems and alarms because there were no problems, no alarms in the control room. But they'd go out and look at it since we were so concerned. So they went out and what they found were all the fans and the oil pumps that kept all that whole system cool, all that cooling was off. And this power plant was running several hundred million watts at the time. In a panic, the operator found a breaker that had been left open from maintenance, closed the breaker. Pumps and fans started, cool, and the transformer became cooled off very rapidly without incident. Also, when they closed that breaker, all the alarms for the transformer came on in the control room. So a, a latent engineering design deficiency had blinded the control room. 
and they were headed for catastrophic a catastrophic event to, that would have destroyed the transformer and that plant would have never operated again and um, it's you know now we're talking 12 years later it's it's still in service and uh, hell actually it's more like uh, 15 years later now last one this is a new this is at a nuclear facility so this is Comanche Peak, located near Clint Rose, Texas, about 85 miles southwest of Dallas. And one day, both of the units are running at 100% power, everything's normal, and then something happens. A major pump, heater drain pump trips on one of the units. And the unit automatically, by design, reduces power to 70% to reactor power. So hundreds of megawatts are load shed and the plant essentially goes into a major power transient and is stabilized at a lower power level. So it was a messy situation. And uh, in the monitoring center in Dallas, they saw that, that the temperatures on that pump, even though it was tripped, were still going up. So they called and talked to the control room operators and and they said, we don't care about that pump. It tripped off. We're trying to stabilize the plant. We've got problems here. And I said, we know you have problems, but look at the pump. And so they did. And they said, you're right. Why are the temperatures screaming up? So they sent out operators to, the, uh, to look at the pump. And a check valve had stuck open when the pump tripped. And reverse flow from another operating pump was making this pump spin in reverse at very high speeds. And the bearings are only lubricated when the machine is spinning in the correct direction. So we were burning up that machine. And the operators were able to isolate uh, the check valve, the flow path, and prevent catastrophic damage to the machine. So this is an example of, of how a remote monitoring center 100 miles away can, can, can take action and add value during a nuclear power plant transient that, that's going on 100 miles away. So these are just a few examples of the type of things that this technology can do to help maintain high levels of reliability, high capacity factors, high levels of safety, and, and optimize uh, revenue. So, so that, so applying all of that capability in the nuclear power industry is part of this demonstration project to evaluate what kind, what, what can we get out of the, out of a nuclear plant? What kind of value can that, can that operation um, deliver? Which really leads into the second objective, creation of this intelligent technology platform. And so, um, I'll, I'll digress just a bit here. Uh, as an industry, you know, we are having to shut down nuclear power plants. And as an industry, we, a few years back, we began collaborating to, as under a program sponsored by the Nuclear Energy Institute, NEI, called Delivering the Nuclear Promise. Delivering the Nuclear Promise was designed to reduce the operating costs of our nuclear generating fleet by 30% over three years at, to preserve, keep these plants running. Well, uh, it's been about five years. We fell short of the 30% cost reduction goal. Depending on what you look at, we've, we've improved operating costs on average probably 12 to 15%, but there's more work to be done uh, to sustain these, these plants. But, but back then, um, as our nuclear industry leaders were trying to figure out how do, what do we do under the delivering the nuclear promise, the then president of the Utility Service Alliance, Carl Perry, Carl called us at Luminate, called, and he said, uh, Clint, as I'm meeting with our industry leaders, I keep thinking about how Luminate's POC could be a solution to help deliver the nuclear promise. Carl envisioned transforming how we do, how we operate a fleet of nuclear power plants 
And he asked the question, can that POC platform somehow be expanded to standardize and automate engineering and technical services for the benefit of USA members fleet of, of, of generators? So that was, that's what got all of this started. And we ultimately, as working with USA, we ultimately put together a grant application that was, and this whole project was funded in 2019 to help make Carl's vision a reality. So can we take the POC and everything it's been doing, build an intelligent platform that can be shared to help drive cost out of operating a fleet of nuclear reactors? And so, New Suite, the concept of New Suite was born. New Suite is a shared services, intelligent technological platform that is being developed as part of this grant. So it's, it will be owned by the participating utilities. Uh, the utilities will have in, independence from many third-party software providers and the annual software license fees and maintenance fees that go along with it. Uh, to the maximum extent practical, this will be open source architecture so that uh, we can build on things that have already been created that are out there. It will interface with the legacy data systems, historians and applications that the plants already use, the telecommunications infrastructure that those, the facilities currently have. And this new suite by design will scale organically as the business processes at the nuclear plants dictate and will become basically a shared services repository for operating experience and history and codification of all of that for the benefit of all participating utilities. So a shared services platform based upon what began at the Power Optimization Center, targeting, mm -hmm. targeting um, cost reductions. Hey, Jeff, can I call you back uh, in the middle of a meeting? So the third objective of the Advanced Remote Monitoring Project is transformation of our nuclear business processes. So New Suite, think of New Suite. New Suite is a platform. And that platform is pulling in not only the data that's coming from the the digital control systems at the plants that, that are monitored, but also expanded systems. This DOE grant is enabling us to add multiple field sensing technologies to the plants to expand our ability to monitor uh, autonomously. So it, using wireless technologies and wired to expand radiation monitoring, to expand acoustic monitoring of areas in the plants, to add cameras and temperature sensors and environmental sensors and smoke detectors and gas detectors, and bring all of that knowledge back into New Suite, where we will develop, just like on that, on, on a smartphone, you've got all the little apps. Well, New Suite will be comprised of standardized apps around different workflows in the power plant and tied into all of these systems. And that will all be married up with machine learning, artificial intelligence technologies to really automate and autonomize nuclear monitoring, data, collect, data collection, analytics reporting, and regulatory compliance. So as a part of ARM, these are the modules that are being developed across the, in this standard, on this standardized platform. Each of the participating utilities is sponsoring one or more of these. And the cool thing is once these are developed, online transformer health monitoring, for example, that will become an app. That app will reside in New Suite. And while that app might've been developed at Columbia, if Susquehanna Nuclear Plant wanted to build out the same capability, the app is available. All they got to do is put in the equipment, map their, their data points into New Suite, into the, the module or the app, 
and boom, there it is. So sharing, building it once and sharing it across the fleet. So this details by utility, by nuclear plant, those projects, those apps, modules that we just talked about. So uh, at Columbia, they, they're, they've, uh, they're making great progress on transformer health and online thermal monitoring. All of their equipment is now installed. And the machine learning, the intelligent tools that are being developed at INL has just been completed in the last week. And we are ready to take that, uh, that, all, that intelligent algorithm and build the new suite app that will ultimately be used for uh, at Columbia. Three of the participating utilities are doing online thermal performance. So the idea is pulling in all of the process data at the plants that are associated with energy conversion efficiencies, thermal efficiencies, and, and cycle losses through that whole energy conversion process to identify uh, efficiency changes and to isolate using technology to isolate where those losses are. Is it a leaky valve or, 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 or a valve left open after a startup? We'll be able to find those things as part of that, as a part of that uh, new suite module. At Comanche Peak, automating uh, many of the regulatory requirements that are imposed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will be automating shiftly, they call them surveillances, tests, inspections, we are, instead of humans walking around taking readings in hundreds of rooms, wireless sensing technologies will pull in the data, will collect the data, pull it in, do the analytics and generate the required report for NRC. Instead of operators spending a, a good chunk of their time, probably 20% of their time walking around doing manual inspections, we're gonna let all that those field sensing technologies to monitor the power plant environment and generate alarms. And we'll only send out humans by exception when something is changing in, in the plant environment. Uh, here at Xcel Energy, the process anomalies detection. This is an advanced all machine learning algorithm that will be monitoring the plant computers, the plant controls at, at these facilities and be able to recognize when an instrument problem you know, temperature, pressure transmitter, flow transmitter, there's something going wrong and it will help identify, is it a transmitter issue or is it a real process, physical process issue in the plant to help speed up human response and diagnostics to help, to help solve problems before they, uh, while they're small, before they become much bigger pro uh, pro problems. And this is actually uh, Lehigh, is participating in the process anomalies uh, detection uh, project, doing much of the fundamental um, research into best approaches for building this, uh, this system. Lastly, at Susquehanna Talent Energy, automating of, of, of fire, the Firewatch uh, compensatory programs. Throughout all nuclear power plants, when we take down portions of the fire protection system, you have to put humans out there to, to watch and just uh, to watch for the emergence of a, of a fire spontaneously happening. And so there are, there are um, fixed and hourly roving fire watches throughout these facilities. The idea here is we can put cameras, acoustics and smoke sensors not acoustics, cameras and smoke sensors out in these on mobile carts and put these out in the plant and use the wireless infrastructures to bring the data back and generate alarms in a central facility and then send out humans by exception upon the validation a, a fire might be emerging. So again, automation of things that are done in a very manual fashion to automation, just that one itself, on a per station basis, that's half a million dollars a year if we can automate that kind of program. All right, 
stakeholder benefits. So what, what's all this about and, and why is DOE investing in all this? Sounds great. Well, for the participating utilities at the Utility Service Alliance, all of these technologies are designed to strengthen and, and preserve high levels of safety, performance, and reliability using technology rather than expensive human, uh, human labor. Also, uh, as a part of this, this is an industry demonstration. So we're doing this on a small scale at the facilities to get an indication of what the ultimate benefits are if we were to scale this to full production levels. And as a part of the DOE project, we'll be bringing in an independent third party to evaluate what, what is created, the benefits that the, that the demonstration delivers, and at scale, what the ultimate benefits to, the, to that power plant uh, could ultimately be. And also the USA Back to New Suite, standardized technology platform that they will own and be able to maintain their business without having to pay multiple uh, fees and licenses to third party software providers. Um, second, the larger nuclear industry. It is USA's absolute intention to take all the learnings from this and make that available to our, uh, our colleagues across the industry. So that includes a strategic roadmap for how we can technologically transform the United States uh, nuclear industry. And that's gonna be supported by a business case for re-engineering, redesigning our workflow processes, our business processes. And there's going to be some places where we, we, we miss. There are going to be gaps in the technology or opportunities we discover where more could be applied to derive even more value from an automation and, uh, and, and, and analytical perspective. So benefits for the nuclear industry to help sustain it. And lastly, our nation. Ultimately, the goal here and why, why is why DOE is investing in this. So it is to sustain the large scale benefits of nuclear power, to maintain our energy security, reliability of our grid, to preserve our nation's single largest source of zero carbon generating capacity, and reduce the need for many of the new and ongoing subsidies that are keeping some of the nuclear plants operational. And so those are, those are the benefits uh, for, for this project. And uh, in closing, uh, reflecting on, on where we started, Atoms for Peace. Technological disruption, environmental priorities, and economic realities are bringing about a radical transformation of the electric utility industry. And working together under projects like delivering the nuclear promise, like the advanced USA's advanced remote monitoring project, we will preserve atoms for peace. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes the formal presentation portion of today's session. And I'm glad to uh, thank you for your attention and I'm glad to answer any questions. Oh, thank you, Clint. That was a really uh, terrific talk. So uh, as we do normally in such uh, seminars, I'd like to open the floor for questions from students. And then we'll entertain the industry folks. Uh, but don't uh, let that stop you. If you have questions and you want to enter the, that in the chat box, please go ahead and we will read out the questions for Clint to answer. Okay, so we're open to questions. Please students unmute yourself before you ask your question and of course, introduce yourself. Students? Um, hi, my name's Anna. I'm one of um, Rudy's students. Um, my question is, um, could technologies like New Suite be used for other types of energy generation sources, not just for nuclear? Thank you, Anna. Absolutely. 
uh, New Suite can be used by any industry. You know, it could be used in, in fossil generation, it could be used in oil and gas. It can be used as a backbone for uh, deployment of uh, smart cities capabilities, for example. It is, it is um, industry agnostic. Um, is there any like research being done into applying it into other technologies right now or not, uh, not yet it's still early uh, mm -hmm. new, new suite is based upon power suite which is what the power optimization center operates on we actually have had interest i mentioned smart cities we we have had interest from some international investors that are involved in the creation of smart city technologies um, in uh, across Southeast Asia. And so we're getting some interest now, but it's it's still a little bit early in the game. Um, but I, but we do see that once, you know, that right now we're a year and a half into a three, this three year uh, initiative with DOE. At the conclusion of the three years, we will have a, a prototype, a new suite prototype, you know, with the apps that uh, that we outlined in the presentation, but that's just the beginning. We see that that growing as as the business dictates in nuclear. We see we see interest in the in other industries. We've had uh, numerous numerous industries and and uh, uh, delegations from various countries have been through the monitoring center, seen the capabilities. Many have tried to replicate it, some successful, some, some more so than others, um, but there is interest. And this is, what all of this represents is, is the beginnings of how our electric grid will eventually be managed. You know, we're right now we have big generators and, you know, big grids and everybody ties into the big grids and, and we're migrating to distributed energy resources now where there'll be smaller, um, environments, you know, neighborhoods and 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 uh, industrial uh, uh, areas, sectors that you know generate their own electricity, sell their spare electricity on the grid, maybe. Uh, and uh, this type of operating and monitoring and and operating system ultimately can be used at at those levels. And, and then tie and tie all that together and, to help make it work. So we're at the very beginning of, of what fourth industrial revolution technologies will do to, to electric generation. Thank you very much. I really like the idea, by the way. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from students to Clint? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Liam. Um, I'm another one of Purdue students. Uh, in the ESC program, and something that um, that I noticed from your your examples that you were giving of situations where this technology has been helpful in um, in identifying problems before they happen, uh, something I noticed was you always had to make a call, and it seemed like there was some kind of communication breakdown, somebody like a lack of trust. Somebody's like, oh, who's this, who's this guy in Texas trying to tell us what to do? Yeah. It seems like that's a place where a lot of risk could be involved, where um, in that small amount of time, maybe this situation is really, really pressing. So how, how do you guys want to mitigate that risk? Well, yes, that... Thank you for the question, Liam. That, that is all business is the people business. And core to the success of remote monitoring is trust. Trust between the, the folks in the center and the folks that are operating those power plants hundreds or thousands of miles away. And so it, that is a real legitimate challenge. And we fight that every, every single day, honestly. Those that have been with us since, you know, for 15 years, you know, I've, those that, that have known us and reaped the benefits 
those relationships have been developed. The operating crews, the operating supervisors, the engineers, they've all been to the center, spent the day with us. Uh, we've sent our folks to the plants, developed those relationships. And, uh, and that's been key for our success. And so developing that, that trust. And, and you got to go through that with every plant. I've heard more than one operations manager at, at, at the plants talk about how they've come to view the POC as an extension of their own control room. I'll tell you my best story, we got time. We, ha we were monitoring a large fleet of coal plants up in the Wisconsin area a few years back. So they, they flew down some of their operators to spend the day with us because they, you know, they, they didn't really know about this monitoring center in Texas is going to be watching how they do things. And so the operator, a couple of operators came in, flew into Dallas. This guy walked in. He had his, he had his Harley Davidson shirt, long hair. He was probably, he was six foot four tall. I mean, he was a big guy. And he walked in, crossed his arms and looked around and just shook his head when he came in. He wanted nothing, nothing to do with this monitoring center. So he sat down, he, we spent the day with us. He started responding to alarms coming from his own power plant in Wisconsin, calling the control rooms and saying, hey, this is Jerry, I'm, I'm here in Texas. Um, you guys might wanna go look at this, I, I can see, wow. And so by the end of the day, he was high-fiving the operators in, in, in the POC. And then a, month, a couple of months later, we had a delegation that went up to the plant that they were installing wireless. At, and and uh, he just happened to be on duty in the control room when our team walked in. He got up, walked across the control room, and hugged the POC engineers that had just walked in because of what they had done for him. Uh, over the last several months. So again, all business is the people business, developing that relationship and managing, preserving that relationship. Without it, all this is worth nothing. Good question, good answer. Uh, any more questions from students? So while the students are pondering, uh, say Clint, uh, what is, the NRC's role, have they blessed this uh, operational center, POC, or this new suite that's under development? They have not blessed it yet. Um, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations has recognized and, and offered uh, strength, industry strengths um, on three separate occasions for the, the services provided to nuclear out of the center. And we have met with uh, senior leadership at uh, NRC headquarters about the ARM project. And they are very interested in partnering and collaborating. Those are their words, the regulator's words, not ours. Mm. As we build this capability out, their intention is to develop, learn about the technologies, evaluate it through their own research and development uh, organization mm -hmm. and craft what they call soft guidelines, which mm -hmm. will be made of distributed, made available to uh, NRC uh, regulatory uh, compliance, the regulatory compliance organization and regulatory enforcement so that they can adopt. They recognize that other industries have moved on while we're still using 1960s, 1970s technologies in, in, these, in these facilities. So um, yeah, they're on board. We've, we've got a ways to go, but that is a part, part of our scope is to enable this technology through our regulator. Good, thank That's really good. That's good to hear too. Mm -hmm. yeah, Hey Clint, we have a, we have a question from Margaret, uh, who is one of our. She's taking the one of the ESE courses. She's a mechanical engineering student at Lehigh. She said you mentioned that one benefit to this technology is that it decreases the need for expensive human labor. Is this also seen as a disadvantage to some because of how human American jobs could be affected? Great question, Margaret. Um... 
as far as affecting jobs, the answer is yes. Um, there's really no way to avoid it. The, the single, you think about a, a, a classic fossil generating facility, a big coal plant, gas plant, the single largest cost is the fuel. Uh, just you know, the volume of fuel that has to, that has to be procured and consumed. That's the single biggest cost. In nuclear, fuel is cheap, very inexpensive. Uranium is cheap. The single largest cost are the people. And the challenge is um, we, have, we have way too many people. Uh, a power plant, if you all are, have, have studied much around nuclear history, you might recall a, a nuclear accident, a small nuclear accident, small in terms of radioactive release at Three Mile Island in the late 1970s. A power plant operating back pre Three Mile Island, let's say a 600 megawatt you know, power plant, would probably have about 300, 350 employees. Many of those plants operating back then that are still operating today now have 700 employees. And that is a result, an outcome of all of the regulatory burden and overhead, formal and informal, that we've placed on this industry over the years. Much of it is unnecessary um, at this point, but we lock all of that in. Our hands are tied with the regulations. And so we have to find a way to unbundle all of that. And so, it, you know, the number of people it takes to run a nuclear power plant isn't the number of people that we have to employ. And the overwhelming majority of, uh, of, uh, of employees that work in nuclear facilities today are at retirement age. And so the, the idea here is we can align this with the, with attrition, not massive layoffs, but attrition. And then, you know, drive, drive down the human workforce, the numbers, the headcount to something that's more reasonable. And then for those that are there that are operating and maintaining those plants as we go forward in the future, to train them on the modern technologies, not the, the obsolete 1970s analog control technologies, those systems are obsolete and, and we're struggling There's, uh, to keep those systems running and, and to migrate to digital technologies. So, so there will, at the end of the day, there will be a smaller workforce footprint at the legacy plants, yes. And, but, and that's where the cost savings will be, the automation of what those folks are doing today, align it with the attrition, and then I think on the upside, when it comes to, uh, to jobs, we haven't even talked about small modular re uh, reactor technologies and the build out of those and the proliferation over, of those in the coming decades. All kinds of new jobs will be coming out of the development of, of next gen reactor technologies. And so, so there's opportunities there. Um, so I think, and electrification, you know, we're, we're, we're electrifying transportation. To do that, the, if you do the math today, we will have to more than double the generating capacity of this nation to completely electrify uh, the transportation industry. That's a staggering number. So there are plenty, as we, as we move, uh, as the industry energy as the energy industry transforms, we adopt more and more renewables, we electrify things. There are many jobs that, uh, all of that offers the promise of many new high paying, high paying jobs. Thank you, that makes a lot of sense. Question, we got plenty of time here. Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, this is Hal. Yes, go ahead Hal. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, yeah, um, just a segue. You just segued into you know, 2050 when we have to be, or we'd like to be zero carbon emissions and so forth. Um, so nuclear power uh, does have, does play a role in this, obviously, as you said. How do you see it going forward in that time frame, the next 30 years? 
uh, to helping us get to um, net uh, zero. And um, you mentioned smaller power plants and so forth. Do you see right now, it looks like we're losing capacity in nuclear. How do you see it going forward though, increasing and even contributing more to the possibility of us getting to zero carbon? Well, Hal, uh, what I see, there, there, there are multiple fronts here. You know, preserving the legacy generating uh, fleet is critical. Uh, if we were to, if we shut down one, just, just one of our large nuclear facilities in the United States and replaced it with quote unquote, clean natural gas, the CO2 contribution from the new gas generation technology that would replace the one, the single nuclear plant would more than offset all of the environmental benefits of all of the solar generation that we've installed across the entire nation to date. That's the impact of losing one of these, one of these plants. So if we are going to achieve uh, carbon net neutrality, and we need to exceed it, by the way, that's a whole other conversation, we can't do it without preserving baseload nuclear, not only in the United States, but you know, um, all the, the Paris Accord, COPS, all of that. We gotta preserve nuclear on a global scale. And as we, so I see preserving nuclear through, through driving, driving down its operating costs. And then over the next, uh, we'll be breaking ground on new smaller modular reactor technologies in the next three to five years. And uh, for that footprint to grow, I think we can see probably a 25 year timeline for that whole, that all those new technologies to grow and get to full production scale. So, uh, so we'll see all of that happening over decades and, and we'll see as we shut down uh, fossil generation technologies, you'll see those small modular reactors being dropped in. You know, the infrastructure, the transmission and distribution systems, all the, the, the switch gear and everything and, uh, is all there. So if, you know, the idea, a perfect site to drop a new uh, uh, advanced reactor technology is where a coal plant exists today. So I see all of that being trans transferred. Uh, to nuclear. Also, other areas, nuclear not only can generate electricity, but uh, nuclear can, can also be used to power water purification systems to desalinate large volumes of water in, in areas where wa uh, water, you know, where there's water scarcity. If and when we develop capabilities to remove carbon from the atmosphere, those, those uh, those, those carbon sequestration systems perhaps could be driven by nuclear reactors. So there's a lot of, um, there, there, there's a lot of opportunity uh, for the application of nuclear. Um, so that's what I see. I see it preserving what's been built, building out to replace fossil generation, and then building out uh, where new generation sources are needed and building out to power other, you know, other, other industrial um, applications. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I really like that idea of putting uh, smaller nuclear plants in to replace an old carbon plant um, and, and use all that infrastructure that's there. It sounds like a great, great, uh, a great use of the old plants. Uh, still make them employment, of course, but but make them um, carbon free. That's really nice. I like that. Idea. Good question, Al. Thank you, Clint. Uh, any more questions for Clint? Uh, I have a question, Rudy. Is, is it okay oh, now? Yes. Uh, so, just part. Uh, Clint, I mean, it's a really great talk. I mean, I quite enjoyed not just the talk, but also the answers and the questions that are being given. I have a couple of questions, and they may be related. One is uh, with proliferation of this kind of advanced, uh, I mean, remote monitoring and making decisions based on the remote monitoring. How important is cybersecurity uh, in this context? Um, that's 
one question. Maybe I'll give my second question also, and you can probably answer both. The second question is in terms of data exchange between different units. Uh, you mentioned something uh, of, of that order as to data exchange between power plants, not necessarily data, but maybe platforms, I don't know. But um, one thing that uh, at least we at Lehigh are sort of interested in is this idea of interdependence between systems, whether it's an electricity and a gas system, whether it's a particular generation and distribution system. Uh, there are challenges, there are ripple effects to any kind of issues that arise in one system that spread over to the other system. I think the Texas power uh, failure that we had some months ago is a very great example of that. So one way to sort of understand uh, and to mitigate the impact of this interdependence is data exchange between systems. But that again, brings to forth cybersecurity issues and even privacy issues for that matter. So I guess my overall question to you is more with regards to cybersecurity and also the vision for where this is going in that context. Well, Parv, um, cyber is an important issue and, and we've got to protect our nation's critical infrastructure. Um, and it's not just nuclear, it's, you can pick the industry. Uh, we have to have cyber resiliency. And so uh, in the electric industry, um, um, the, the Federal Electric Regulatory Commission, FERC and NERC, they have, have cyber security regulations that, that generators and the transmission grid have to comply with. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has many cyber regulations for nuclear plants. And, and simply in nuclear, for, for example, there are, different rank, there are different rings and layers and levels of security from the actual reactor controls to the to the, the local area networks at the plants to the information systems that are used, and and then tie-ins to um, well to you know to the larger internet of things and the and and the internet you know, so on the outside of a nuclear plant you can't hack a nuclear plant from the outside because you get to a point where you can't write, you can, any, any application or system that's used to manage that plant can't be written from, you know, information is one way out and out only. And then when you get down to the actual reactor controls of the plant itself, you've got an air gap. You cannot jump that gap um, and, and, and insert a virus or, you know, something into that space. Now, the same, so that answers that you know kind of addresses we and we've got to manage that it's it's a there it's a mixture of of uh, regulatory requirements and um, what's what uh, protocols uh, standards that have that have evolved in this area those are being applied mm -hmm. also there's a lot of proprietary things that are uh, that are applied uh, to to protect to protect industries to protect businesses and uh, protect government systems and things get hacked once in a while we all we all appreciate that but by design there are you know there's layers there and preserving that philosophy um, it, it's an ongoing thing you're never going to be done you know you're just gonna have to stay a step ahead of the bad guys if you will but the thing is, if the only alternative is to go back to the caveman days where you're totally isolated from the outside world and, and the larger benefits of what technology can offer, particularly when you get to the exchange of data across various platforms and being able to optimize the whole thing as an integrated system, that'll never happen. Um, so there is a level of risk that we're always going to have to accept to some degree, but it's constant vigilance that will, will make us successful. And uh, so uh, that's the best answer I have. No, oh, no, thank you, Clint. That, uh, it was a great answer. Thank you very much. Questions for Clint? We got time, guys. You can put it in the chat box or uh, ask it early.
Rudy, you should give bonus points to the students, you know, 10 points per question um, or something. That was my next uh, move. <laughs> <laughs> but these guys are hard bargaining. Um, so, you know, to that point uh, about, you know, the importance of nuclear, uh, you know, in our grid, you know, one thing is that uh, and you implied that, you know, we've got such great operational experience you know, in the U.S., you know, operating nuclear power plants, designing nuclear power plants. Um, how much is the present administration backing nuclear, you know, as part of their build back better? You know, what's the role of nuclear? So there is a very positive trend um, emerging in the legislation that's being passed by Congress. Uh, legislation, there's, there's literally hundreds, I, th I think it's fair to say hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that are being made available for the promotion of research and development into the next generation reactor technologies. And also for the first time in, I'd say in the last 12 months, maybe, I, I can't nail it exactly, but uh, we're now seeing legislation that is coming out that is targeting the preservation of legacy nuclear. You go back two, three, four, five years, there none. There was zero uh, legislation helping uh, preserve legacy nuclear. And now as we have, it's all, it, it's all an outcome of, of societal, uh, ex, uh, you know, coming acceptance that global warming is real, mankind is a substantial, is a significant contributor, and we got to change the way we do things um, before it's too late. And so, you know, um, uh, Biden's, his, uh, the whole emphasis, I don't have the right terms, but the whole new infrastructure legislation that's being promoted, and uh, there are, there's, there's funds in there for you know, aligned, aligned with, with um, helping migrate, evolve to clean tech, cleaner technologies. And nuclear is, nuclear is a part of that. And there's also legislation and programs through DOE for using nuclear production to generate hydrogen as another, uh, you know, energy storage, energy source for future technologies. So hydrogen so during, during times of low system demand, when nukes are losing money uh, during low demand times, nukes could be generating and storing hydrogen and then reusing that hydrogen or uh, you know, pumping that hydrogen into systems for transport, you know, transportation and other industries that rely on hydrogen technology. So I'm for the first time, very encouraged by what I've, what I've seen recently. And I think a lot of that is, is, can be credited to the current administration. Yeah, good. Questions for Clint? Did you ask him orally or insert into the chat box and uh, Susan will read out your question. So what's this, uh, Clint, uh, while we're waiting for questions, uh, SMRs, could you speak a little bit about them? What's so cool about them and why are they? I can speak a little bit, not, not yet my, my area of expertise, but uh, there's a number of companies. There's New Scale, TerraPower. I think TerraPower is Bill Gates. He's invested there. X Energy, those are three of the biggest right now that DOE is investing in. And these small modular reactors, while they're small, they're still pretty doggone big, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's New Scale that may be building a, a demonstration plant at Idaho National Labs. Uh, I'm getting my wires crossed here. They are building at Idaho. I want to talk X Energy. X Energy has announced a partnership with Energy Northwest, where the Columbia Nuclear Station is in Washington State. They'll be building four SMRs uh, on site there at, um, at, at Columbia. 
And I think they're in the neighborhood of 150, 200 megawatts each. And, and the idea is you can, if, if you need 200 megawatts, you build one SMR. If you need 800 megawatts, you can build four. And as demand goes, you can add another and another in, in that same small footprint. And so there's some really cool things about SMR technologies. I believe they are all, they're all using new uh, fuel reactor fuel designs that are that are inherently safe. They meaning they will not, you know, if, if a traditional legacy nuclear plant loses power, loses cooling to the reactor, you have a meltdown, right? You know, and radioactive materials uh, can can get into the environment and, and do bad things. The new reactors don't require power, don't require operators, don't require any response whatsoever in an accident situation because of the way the fuel's designed. So it's inherent, it's all passive. And so, uh, you know, radiation will not be released in their design basis accidents. And what that means is currently, current fleet, we all have a 10 mile uh, radiate, you know, 10 mile emergency planning zone or 10 mile radius around every nuclear plant where we have to have all these detailed procedures if and when, you know, a bad thing happened. The footprint, you know, the emergency planning zone for a small modular reactor technology would be the, the property boundary itself would be the extent of it. it. It just does not have the potential radiological consequences and while I say that, because I don't want to scare anyone, uh, I, I would offer that the nuclear power industry has this, the highest safety record, bar none, of any industry on the planet Earth. These plants run at high, you mentioned earlier, Rudy, high capacity factors, you know, 90 plus percent reliability in terms of capacity. And they're all designed. Uh, we've never, you know, we had a three, we had the one accident at Three Mile and beyond that, which very, very little, you know, I think we could hold up TMI as an example of how nuclear works. Everything went wrong at TMI, absolutely everything. The safety systems worked. Uh, other than a little bit of, of gas, you know, the thing, it was all contained within the building. And um, these plants are safe. You, you, I, I know you appreciate that. These plants are, I wouldn't hesitate to, to live across the street from a nuclear power plant. It's uh, the safest operating facility. No one's ever died of, uh, in the United States in the nuclear industry as an outcome of some kind of nuclear radiological accident. It just hasn't happened. And uh, because of, because of the safety factors that are built into those systems. Yeah, yeah um, Glenn, one of our students uh, actually is joined a startup company, Keros, in the SMR industry out of New Mexico. So oh. he's, he's still a student, uh, he joined in the summer and he got this offer and uh, there he is. <laughs> Well, that's exciting. I, I think this would be a very exciting time to come out of school and, and, and get started on a career. And right at the very, very beginnings of next generation reactor technologies and being a part of growing that, developing that technology, building it out and, and uh, helping, uh, helping us achieve our, our environmental goals. I can't think of of anything more valuable that uh, or exciting that that you know a new college graduate could 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 focus on over the coming years over you know over their career. Clint, we had we had one question uh, from Jim Daly in our chat. Uh, what is the impediment to capitalizing on the nuclear power plant driving our naval vessels for decades throughout the world's oceans? Uh, can you repeat that one more time, please? I sure. Quite what, what is the impediment to capitalizing on the nuclear power plant driving our naval vessels for decades throughout the world's oceans? 
the impediment. Uh, I can offer some opinions. Uh, you know, our, our naval nuclear fleet, we have benefited a great deal by what was developed in the military. And, you know, those, those Navy submarines, those technologies, the, the, the personnel that come out of the nuclear Navy, you, you know where you find those folks today? Working in the control rooms of nuclear power plants. They are some of the most capable individuals. When you live underwater, <laughs> you know, and the systems that, that, you know, the air you breathe and the, the water you drink is produced by that reactor, you really learn how to operate things. And so I have been thoroughly impressed by the folks that have come out of, of the nuclear Navy. And much of that technology, you know, the pressurized water reactor technologies that are, that, that's in those subs, you know, that technology has been directly applied in, in, in the legacy PWRs that have been built. So we do leverage, we do leverage what's there. Uh, could we take their reactors and just pop them around everywhere? We haven't done that in the past because of the enrichment. You know, those submarines, many of those submarines, I think, you know, they're never refueled. They'll run 20, 30 years <laughs> with, with their reactor core. That's because they are highly, highly enriched uranium-235. In other words, bomb grade, nuclear bomb grade kind of stuff. And you, that's, you know, 95, 98% enriched uranium. So, so think about that. 95% in a commercial nuclear power plant, the enrichment levels are in the neighborhood of 3 to 5%. So not nuclear bomb grade stuff. So I, that's one of the reasons that it that there, there's a there's a distinction there because of the you know because of the military's mission those those subs need to run for many many years they got to have that kind of reactor technology when making that available to the public is is you know from a nuclear weapons proliferation perspective is. Wasn't, hasn't been advisable to date to do that kind of thing. My point in asking that was just that they are small reactors, particularly the ones on the carriers. They're uh, a pair of 100 megawatt reactors. It seems that you don't have to have a thousand megawatt uh, nuclear yeah. reactor. If you, you have the 100 megawatt size, they can be built closer to and with more uh, security to the uh, demand areas. There is a population where the demand uh, demand is there. You don't have to put them out in the boonies and then transmit the energy. You can put it where the demand is. Makes a lot of sense, Jim. I, and, and, and I agree with that. And, and that is the, the foundational philosophy of around small modular reactors. You know, 100, 150 megawatts. You know, that, that's what those reactors are. And then that married up with the uh, you know, the passive safety systems um, so that, uh, you know, the, the minimizing any, any radiological consequences to the, to the areas that they're placed, uh, that's, that's foundational and uh, builds on that same philosophy. Well, I'd like to thank you, Glenn, for your time you spent and really how many things that you touched upon and the importance of nuclear. You know, on behalf of Lehigh University, we're so uh, fortunate to be working with you guys and you know, seeing the exciting things that can happen. And, uh, you know, really my experience working with you for so many years, you know, I know that this is going to lead to some very interesting development. And um, so I just want to kind of thank you again on behalf of Lehigh University and just want to announce that in one week's time, October 11th, the next seminar will be on what is sustainable electric power portfolio. It will be by one of my other colleagues at EPRI, uh, who will stress this out next spring uh, in a series of lectures you know, to Lehigh University about you know, all areas of sustainability, which includes technology sustainability, environmental sustainability, and economic sustainability. And so that's, uh, you'll hear a preview of those uh, expanded lectures next week, October 11th, at the same time. 
But I just want to thank you again, Clint, and uh, and a virtual round of applause, you know, for you for your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. Enjoyed it quite a bit, and uh, good luck in your in your endeavors. And if there's if, all of y'all, please feel free. If uh, you have any questions later, or you'd like to chat, or just bounce ideas, uh, please feel free to to contact me and uh, yeah. Rudy can get through get my contact information to you oh, and great and Clint one other thing if you can share your slides with, with us if you can send us send me the uh, whatever you know sanitized version I'll be glad to distribute that very well I'll do that thank you all thank you Clint thank you everyone Well, that was nice, uh, Susan. Yeah, that went really well. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, you asked me a question about November 8th. Yes. Well, I'm working up a contingency plan. You know, I have a feeling that's not going to work out with them, but uh, we'll probably have somebody from PPNL. Okay. And uh, anyway, he's spoken to us uh, before, before you join. He's a good speaker too. Oh, cool. Yeah. And you know, you did get the news about this keynote speaker from PPNL for our project symposium. Yes. Uh, so um, anyway, we will talk about it in the uh, meeting, weekly meeting on Wednesday. Yeah, um, and I just want to let you know, I, I removed everybody now. <laughs> there are people just like hanging out there. I think they like left their office or whatever. So I just kind of like sh shoved them out the door. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you um, do that? Uh, you right click on their name and you can, 